Tammy about the uh, Lutheran church and whether or not they meet on Saturday. And no, they don't. They believe that the Sabbath day was fulfilled in Christ, uh, as the book of Hebrews does say, but they believe that the Lord's day has replaced the Sabbath day. And so, because the Lord was raised on the first day of the week, so they worship on Sunday. Uh, they do not worship on Saturday. It's not that they're against it. It's just they don't believe that's the day of worship. That's not what, even though part of that answer is why we worship on Sunday, as far as we didn't find examples of it. Uh, we find the disciples gathering together on the first day of the week to break bread in Acts 20. We find them gathering together on the first day of the week to give up their means. And there is a movement among the denominations to go back to the Sabbath day. They believe that the, the, the church met daily, and it did. And they come along and say, well, we should not condemn Sabbath day worship. And we shouldn't condemn Sabbath day worship as far as the church gathering together. There's nothing wrong with the church gathering together on Saturday. We're going to be doing that next month for our English-Chinese broadcast. We're going to be doing that for our gospel meeting, Lord willing, in May. We'll gather on Saturday to worship God. There's nothing wrong with worshiping on Saturday. However, the Lord's Day is a special day to worship God. And it is a day that we partake of the Lord's Supper. It is a day we give of our means. We can do all of the other things any day of the week we choose. Uh, and so that is the answer to your question on the Lutherans. Uh, I thought I'd take that right off the bat, saying, showing you I did look it up. But... We are talking about the Mennonites uh, this evening. The Mennonites and the Lutherans were very close, and it, it really has to do with where they are. Luther was in Germany, uh, in Wittenberg, and so uh, the Lutheran church began in Germany, whereas the Mennonite church began in Zurich, and really it was a split between Zwingli, if we remember Zwingli was contemporary with Luther, uh, as far as the Reformation goes, and he was in Switzerland. And the Mennonites didn't agree with uh, Zwingli. Uh, they weren't Catholic, they agreed that way, but they didn't agree with Zwingli, and so they separated. And they became the Anabaptists, uh, and they were organized in Holland uh, by 1534. And the reason why they're called Mennonites is because uh, Simons, uh, Mino Simons was converted and of course his first name, Mino is, if you're followers of Mino, you are a Mennonite uh, and so that's where they get that name Anabaptist though is really what they were called, that's more of a pejorative term even though they took it on it means rebaptizer and they and the Lutherans and, and the early reformers didn't get along they were heavily persecuted, which is why they came to the Americas in the late 1600s, and they settled in Pennsylvania and Ohio, Virginia and Indiana, Illinois, and in Ontario. Uh, we have, you go to St. Jacob's, uh, you're going to find a heavily Mennonite, uh, uh, Mennonite area. You will find an Amish area where you, you see signs, watch out for horse and buggy. And um, yeah, so they are... They, they were present in Ontario, and they're present uh, a lot in Pennsylvania, in mid, mid, middle Pennsylvania. Uh, you will find Amish country there uh, as well. And so we talked last week about uh, some of the beliefs of the Mennonites. We discussed that there were a lot of things that they believe that are true. And we must remember that we don't disagree with 100% of what the denominations teach. We agree on some major issues uh, when it comes to salvation, which is a foundational issue. 
We, we disagree on a whole bunch of other things too, but on the foundational issue of how one is saved, if you can't agree on that, there's not much else. All the other stuff it is really peripheral. It doesn't really matter uh, because you don't agree on how one is saved. But they believe in uh, faith in God as the creator. And God the Father is the creator. Jesus Christ is God's son. Redemption of man on the cross. Obedience to Christ's law and the gospel. And the necessity of repentance and conversion for salvation. That's really where we end it. Uh, I can't remember whether we got into baptism or not. But I want to cover baptism again, even if we did. Uh, they, dis they believe on baptism that it is a public testimony of one's faith. And whenever you start seeing that type of language, whenever you start seeing baptism being called a sign, that's code for it's not really necessary for salvation. You've already been saved. And all you do to be baptized is that just shows others of the grace that is in you. In other words, a Christian who has received grace, God will move them to be baptized. That is an attitude of faith. That is an act of faith. It is by no means necessary for salvation because salvation is by grace alone, which of course is also wrong. But the scriptures teach us that baptism is not just a public testimony of faith. Yes, people who see you being baptized, they do see that you do have faith. A person will not be baptized if they do not have faith in Christ. They just won't. That's it, it, If salvation was just by baptism alone, if all you had to do, we'd go out into the streets of Toronto and we grab people and we take them to a public pool or we take them to the Lake of Ontario, Lake Ontario and just dunk them in water. Someone who doesn't have faith in Christ, though, all you've done is gotten them wet. Faith is required, but baptism is much more than a public testimony of your faith. It is necessary for salvation. Let's, let's get some verses uh, that teach that. Uh, Tammy can get Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Uh, uh, Bill can get Acts chapter 22, or Tammy can get Acts 2.38, Bill can get Acts 22.16, and Henry can get 1 Peter 3.21. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. And Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. What I'd like you to do is actually get back up to verse 37 and read that as well. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? All right, so if, if, if you're cut to the heart, what does that mean? You're cut to the heart. This is, of course, re in, in response to Peter's message. Well, your conscience has moved. Your... Oh. All right, your conscience has moved. All right, you're cut to the heart. Yeah. Do, you dis do you believe or disbelieve the message? Well, the message bothers you. <laughs> yeah. Like you're not. Yeah, the message is bothering you. So if the message is bothering you, you must believe the message. Uh, if, if the message if the message didn't bother you, it's just like any other story. Someone gets up and they can they say something, ah, I really don't believe them. Uh, I really don't care. And so this message though cut them to the heart, got their conscience thing, they'd just been called murderers of Jesus Christ. They had just been called the murderer of the Messiah, the one that had been prophesied in the Old Testament to come. They believed that. It cut them to their heart. Now, according to denominational teaching today, when they asked men and brethren, what shall we do? I heard on the radio. Whenever someone asks you, what must I do? Nothing. That's what I heard. Nothing. That's not what Peter said. Peter said, repent. Um, Mennonites believe that. But Peter said, be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. For the remission of sins. Peter said that after they believed. After they believed. Not before. After they believed. For the remission of sins. Now, people like to try come along and say that word for really means because. All right, if someone wants to argue that, 
Let's go to Acts chapter 22 and verse 16. This is a verse that doesn't have that, that word in there people like to skate around on. Uh, Acts 22, 16. And now, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized, and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. All right. Saul of Tarsus being spoken to here. He saw Jesus on the road to Damascus. He was told to go into the city. He will be told what you must do. Ananias comes here. And Saul had already believed. It's been three days since, since he saw Jesus on the road to Damascus. And a nice thing. What are you waiting for? You believe? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins. Again, we find washing away the remission of sins firmly connected to baptism. It's not connected to repentance. It's not connected to confession. And it's not connected to belief. It's connected to baptism. In Acts chapter 2.38 and Acts chapter 22 verse 16. There's no because in here. It always, it's firmly planted to baptism. And for those who do not believe that baptism has anything to do with salvation, we have 1 Peter chapter 3, Henry, verse 21. There is also an anti-type which now saves us. That didn't not remember more for the gifts of the flesh, but the answer of the good conscience, the word of God, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. All right, I, I, had a, I had a person write on our YouTube channel about baptism not saving us, and he says, you guys are reading 1 Peter chapter 3, 21, that baptism is a type. And I had to tell him, no, baptism is an anti-type. The type is a shadow of things. Baptism was an anti-type of what happened to Noah. Noah was saved by water. And baptism is now the anti-type. Salvation by baptism is the real thing. Just like Noah was saved by water, not because he got wet and was cleansed physically. Baptism also is now saved, now saves us. God's mode of saving Noah was water. God's mode of saving mankind in the New Testament is water baptism. And I don't know how much clearer the scriptures can be. Uh, the light figure to where even baptism does also now save us. So the Mennonites are wrong here. Baptism is much more than a public testimony of your faith. It is for the remission of sins, and it is for salvation. If I am not baptized, I cannot be saved, according to the scriptures. I just cannot. Uh, and if I don't believe what my baptism is for, if I don't believe in that, I don't have faith in what this baptism is doing. And, and that's really the question that people need to realize, well, do I need to understand what this baptism is doing? Yes, you do. Not in the deepest of sense, but you need to know why you're being baptized. You need to have faith. Okay, I'm being baptized because God said he's going to remit my sins. That's what you need to know. But if you go into the waters believing God has already remitted my sins, you have faith in something else. You don't have faith in what God is doing for you. And so that's why it is necessary for you to know why you're being baptized. And if you were baptized with this other baptism, Acts 19 would show us that you need to be baptized properly. You need to be baptized according to the scriptures. But moreover, Mennonites also believe in different modes of baptism. Remember, in the New Testament, baptism was immersion. We've studied that. And slowly the Catholics took it away. They changed it because sick people couldn't be baptized, and so they, they instituted sprinkling or pouring. If you, recall, if you recall all the way back to our studies of the, about the Catholics, that that's why. And then eventually it just became uh, the mode of baptism, sprinkling or pouring. And then, of course, infant baptism was added to that. The Anabaptists didn't believe in infant baptism, but they did believe 
that baptism could be done by immersion, but it also could be done by sprinkling or pouring. The Bible teaches, however, that baptism is only by immersion. Let's go to Romans chapter 6. Since Naomi's not here this evening, I'll, I'll join in the reading, verses 3 and 4. For do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, just so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. If baptism is necessary for the forgiveness of sins, then we need to do it properly. If sprinkling a point is excessive, ex acceptable. If that's what baptism is, then that's fine. However, if it's not, then what we're, we're doing is really not baptism. And if it is important, we better do it right. So the Mennonites are wrong when it comes to baptism. And that's something that being wrong here really matters. Really does, because it's a salvation issue. Uh, some, some people try to come up and say, well, it doesn't really matter to God. <clears throat> Some things might not, but this definitely does. This definitely matters because it is a it is the way God saving us by faith. But we must do His will. Any comments or questions before we move on? I know we've discussed baptism many times. Uh, the Mennonites also believe the Lord's Supper is an expression of common union and fellowship. Uh, the, I, I wouldn't disagree that the Lord's Supper can express that. It is a remembrance of Christ. Uh, it's a remembrance of his death, but why do we call it communion? Well, union is right in there. Com communion is togetherness. That's why, we, that's why we partake of the Lord's Supper in the church, not in the building, but among brethren. That's why we don't partake of it alone by ourselves. We don't take it around to people to say, well, you need this sacrament. We don't treat it like that. Uh, if you miss the Lord's Supper on Sunday because you were hindered from being there, whether sick or traveling, yeah, we try not to do that. But it, we don't have to take the Lord's Supper ourselves in order to be right with God. We're not treating the Lord's Supper properly if we treat it like a sacrament. However, when we're together with other Christians on Sunday, we partake of the Lord's Supper, and we do so together. And uh, Mennonites, though, even though they express this as a communion, a common union, and fellowship, they only practice it twice a year. They, I, I don't know, well, I'm sure Easter is one of them. I don't know whether Christmas is the other one. But they only do practice it twice a year. The Bible, though, of course, teaches us that Christians did this every Sunday. In Acts chapter 20, Timmy, in verse 7. Now on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. Now there's a word that's missing that a lot of people try to always like to point out in Acts chapter 20, and it's the word every in that passage. They say it doesn't say now on the first day of every week when the disciples gather together to break bread. And they, they hinge on that word every and say the disciples didn't gather together to break bread every Sunday. This was a special Sunday. Well, I would like to know which special Sunday this was because the Feast of Passover and the Days of Unleavened Bread were already behind. Acts chapter 20 says that in verse uh, 6. It says the Days of Unleavened Bread had passed. The Day of Pentecost was still to come. That's why Paul was rushing later on in the chapter. It says in verse 16, Paul was hurrying to Jerusalem in order to be there on the Day of Pentecost. Now, we don't live under the Old Testament law. Uh, and so these feasts are not important to us to observe today. But even still, Easter, as, as people like to observe, 
would have been observed around the Passover. It would not have been if it was observed, and it wasn't. But I'm just saying, if Easter was there, it would be around the Passover. And so that wasn't a special day. We draw the conclusion that they partook of every first day of the week because that's when Christians gathered together. This was not a special Sunday. We don't read of it. This is the first Sunday of the, of the month, and that's when the disciples gathered together. We read of an example of the disciples gathering together on Sunday to break bread, to eat of the Lord's Supper. And since we find no other example, who are we to change when the Lord's Supper is partaken of? There are 52 Sundays in a year, sometimes 53, sometimes 51, but however many Sundays there are in the year, that's how many Sundays we gather together, that's how many Sundays we eat the Lord's Supper. Uh, we don't pick two Sundays a, a year or once a month or once a quarter. We don't find those examples. We follow the authority in the New Testament. And that, that, that's the difference a lot of the times between us and the denominations. Is we respect the authority of God. If the Bible says something, we do it. If the Bible doesn't say something, we refrain from it. And this is the example we find. Uh, we live in a day and age, though, that people don't want to condemn each other. People don't want to say that's wrong. Well... We don't say something is wrong to people's peril. Because if the Lord wanted us to remember Jesus every first day of the week, and we choose not to, what are we saying about our love for God and Jesus? Not that much. Next we come to marriage, and I'd like to spend a couple minutes on this, even though, uh, even though there aren't as many verses sitting there. I, I would like to deal with uh, a couple things when it concerns as it concerns marriage the Mennonites are very strict uh, when it comes to who a Mennonite can marry and still be a practicing Mennonite and they say that marriage is only acceptable among believers and if someone wanted to marry someone who is not a believer they better become a believer before you marry them because they believe the Bible condemns that. And uh, some of the verses that are used to try and teach this, uh, one is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. It's not on your page, so I'm sorry, Bill, if you were at the other verse. Mm -hmm. But could you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7 uh, and go all the way to uh, verse... 39 and 40. Or say just 39. Okay. Um, a wife is bound by law as long as her husband lives. But if her husband dies, she is at liberty to be married to whom she wishes, only in the Lord. It's that last four words, only in the Lord, that people like to grab on and they say, well, the Corinthians, when they were converted, one, either the, the wife or the husband, they may have, one of them might become Christians and one of them not. And chapter 7 says, don't divorce your spouse for that reason. Uh, that's not an acceptable reason. Remain with them. But then if they die, of course, you're allowed to remarry. Marriage ends with death. And people say, well, you're allowed to remarry. You're allowed to marry whoever you wish, only in the Lord. And they say, what, what does only in the Lord mean? Only those who are Christians. But I'd like, to, I'd like to examine the same phrase as it's found someplace else. In Ephesians chapter 6. In Ephesians chapter 6, uh, Henry, would you get verse 1? Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Now my question is, it's the same phrase in the Lord, not only in English, it's the same phrase in the Greek. Are children only to obey their parents if their parents are Christians? Is that what this verse is saying? No, verse 2 says you're supposed to honor your father and mother. No, it doesn't matter 
if your parents are Christians, children are still to obey their parents. If that doesn't mean children obey your Christian parents, for this is right, what does the phrase in the Lord mean? What does the phrase in the Lord mean? According to the Lord's will. It goes with what Bill just read from verse 2. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. That is the will of God. That's in the Lord. So, children obey your parents following the Lord's commandments, for this is right. So, bringing it back to 1 Corinthians chapter uh, uh, 7. Are there people that single people, people who have a right to marry, are not allowed to marry. Is there someone who would fit that? You can't marry family. All right, you can't marry family. Okay. I wasn't thinking about that, but sure. Uh, th that would be true. Oh, they're unscripturally divorced. They're unscripturally divorced. Uh, can't marry that. Or someone who is still married. Uh, can't marry those people. So when you bring it back to 1 Corinthians 7, it says, you know, a wife is bound to her husband by the law as long as he lives. But if he dies, she may marry whomever she wishes, only in the Lord. Only you can't marry people the Lord says you can't marry. You can't marry your family. You can't marry a person who's unscripturally divorced. You can't marry someone who's currently married. You can't do that. You would otherwise be committing sin yourself. And so 1 Corinthians chapter 7 is not teaching what we think it's teaching. You have to remember the context of that chapter it is talking about a time of distress, a time of persecution. Paul says there are certain situations where it's better not to marry. And if we take that chapter and rip it right out of its context, You'll come along and try to teach that, okay, it's better not to marry because of, because of these things. You can focus your time on the Lord, so, so don't marry. That's not what Paul was saying at all. There's a reason why it was better not to marry. is because there was a time of persecution coming, and when it would be better not to be married. However, if the person could not refrain from unscripturally satisfying their bodies, uh, then they needed to marry. Uh, and so, there's that. Anyone think of another passage people like to use to, uh, there's a couple other ones, people might like to use to uh, try to teach that we shouldn't uh, marry unbelievers. Those more or less. six. Verse 14. What, you want to read it? <laughs> um, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? That, that, that's the verse that people often run to. And the problem with using that verse in that way his marriage is not what Paul is talking about in this passage. We've got to remember to keep it in the context. We've got to remember that. Uh, let's back up to verse 11. And we're going to read all the way to the end of the chapter, which is verse 18. We'll do two verses each and start with Henry, and I'll read uh, as well. Uh, first Corinthians, Second Corinthians chapter 6, beginning of verse 11. You are not restricted by us, but that you are restricted by Verse God. 11, 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 6. Corinthians. Corinthians, we have spoken openly to you. Our, our power is wide open. Is this right? Yeah, yeah. But you are not restricted by us, but that you are restricted by your own perfections. Now, in, the, in, in return for the same, I speak as, I speak as to children, 
you all uh, you also be open. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has believer with unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Uh, therefore come out from among them and, and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Paul, and, and if you read on through into chapter 7 too, Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Uh, that really does that really does complete the chapter, even though it's found in verse one of chapter seven. Paul is dealing with sin here. He is saying, "You're Christians. What are you doing, acting like the world? What are you doing, acting like them?" Don't be unequally yoked. A believer and an unbeliever don't, if you want to use a sports analogy, play for the same team. One follows the flesh. We're to follow the spirit. We are to act like Christians do. I'm not saying that this passage does tells Christians just go out and marry non-Christians. It doesn't. It would, should serve as a warning to Christians, don't marry non-Christians. But when we use scripture to try and teach something that is not the topic of conversation here, Paul is not talking about marriage, he is talking about sin. He is talking about uh, idol worship, just like he did in 1 Corinthians 10. You don't go to the idol's temple and sit at the idol's table, not because you believe the idol's anything, but other people do. And I think you're going to be worshiping the idol. Don't mix righteousness with sin. And so it's dangerous and it's inconsistent to come to this passage and say, okay, that teaches you can't marry non-Christians. It doesn't teach that. The idea might be there, but it's not there. Another passage that people like to use is 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And I'll get Tammy to get this one. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33. Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Again, this is another passage. You often see this on... Uh, online, you might see it on a bumper sticker, you might see it. This is a nice phrase. Don't be deceived, evil company corrupts good habits. Again, the passage tells the truth, but in the context of this, the Corinthians were associating themselves with people who were teaching them that the resurrection was already passed or there wasn't going to be a resurrection. And Paul was trying to tell them if there's no resurrection, there's no point in being a Christian. See what happens? Evil company corrupts good habits. Evil company, if you accept false doctrine, it's going to corrupt you. And so again, the context is key. The fact of the matter is the Bible does not make a restriction against marrying a non-Christian. However, it does highly recommend it. There are problems that arise when you marry a non-Christian. You're going to have children. Well, what, uh, where are they going to go to church? You married an atheist, are they going to go to church? Well, uh, what, what are we going, what standards are we going to live by? And the fact of the matter is, a lot of the time, when you marry a non-Christian, they will have influence on you and may get you to either accept their faith if they have some, 
or leave the faith altogether. And so, yes, 2 Corinthians chapter 6 can show us a principle, but it doesn't teach a restriction. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 can teach a principle, but we can't take it to the point of a restriction. No in the New Testament. We can go to the Old Testament, and we can teach that God told Israel, don't marry the people around about you, but we can't apply that to us, because the Old Testament is not our law. God could have easily said the same thing to us that he said to Israel. Paul could have quoted the book of Deuteronomy, like he quotes Deuteronomy a lot, he quotes Numbers a lot. In fact, when Bill read the, the passage, be, come out and be separate, that's from the book of Numbers. But again, in that context, he's talking about from sin, be separate from sin. He didn't quote the part about marriage. If God wanted to restrict marriage that way, he would have said so. And so we cannot go above and beyond what the Word of God says. We can counsel, not a good idea. We can counsel uh, to, to marry Christians. We cannot forbid it. Uh, and so uh, the Mennonites take it a step too far uh, when it comes to marriage. And so we should not make law where God does not make law. We're often accused of making law where God made no law. This is one of the places where it would be making law where there is no law. I am not ashamed to own my Lord, nor 